Hotels host people from every walk of life. Fleeting visitors often anonymous. Truly anything can happen in these places. What is more, the events which transpire behind such walls rarely ever gets revealed. Until now. The paranormal scholar once again welcomes horror narrator Mortis Media to help narrate these allegedly true tales of the paranormal. I'm definitely a people person, so it didn't take me long to work my way up the ladder at our hotel. I loved that hotel. It was old, built in 1967. Despite the shambles it was in when I worked there, it used to be the most happening place in town. The decor was unlike a lot of hotels you see today. Elaborate chandeliers and imported Spanish tiles, as well as beautiful, handmade stained glass skylights. A lot of people were shocked our rooms were only $50 a night. It wasn't long before I realized why. Something was just off about that place. We had this service hallway that connected the kitchen and the storage rooms to all of the conference rooms. It was my first day and I was taking a tour of the facility with my manager. I remember noticing how it smelled like a nursing home like mothballs and death. And it was just unnaturally cold, especially for Louisiana in the spring. The deeper we went down the hallway, the colder it got. I actually started to feel sick at one point. At the time, I just put it off as nerves. However, a couple of weeks later, I realized it wasn't me. It was whatever was in that hallway. I was working the 3 to 11 shift. Around 8 or 9 p.m., I went to find a guest some silverware in the kitchen. I was still pretty new there, so after searching for the light switch, I gave up and used my phone as a flashlight to grab the silverware. That was when I noticed the sound of footsteps. Really fast footsteps. I started to turn around when someone, something, ran right past me into the dark, knocking over the stack of dishes on the prep table. Needless to say, I forgot all about the silverware and ran the hell out of there. I ended up calling a housekeeper who stayed in the hotel occasionally to grab it from the kitchen. She told me no one was in there. No one who worked at the hotel wanted to go in that hallway. Even the cook would bring her granddaughter with her in the morning to keep her company while she got breakfast started. No one ever knew what exactly was back there. No one asked, either. I guess we just didn't want to find out. After that experience, I was sufficiently scared, but curious also. I had become friends with our elderly breakfast cook. She was a little old woman, probably in her seventies, called Mrs. J for the sake of this recollection. She mentioned that she had been working there since the early seventies. After she told me stories of that place, I never looked at that hotel the same again. She told me that, as the owner was cheap, he never purchased security cameras for the entire property. He installed two actual cameras in the lobby, one at each entrance, and one by the pool, but placed mock cameras down the halls by the rooms. They gave the appearance of security, when actually they were just plastic boxes. Anyway, one night a young lady checked in stinking drunk, by herself at one in the morning. She requested a smoking room, which are only located on the back side of the property on the second floor. This area is also one of the many blind spots for the hotel's limited cameras. After she went to her room, no one heard from her for the rest of the night. That was until the housekeeper showed up in the morning to find the woman in the parking lot, covered in blood and whiskey, dead. Apparently, after she checked in, she had continued her binge on the balcony facing the parking lot. She must have fallen off and bled to death. 
The horrifying part is that she must have still been alive after the fall, because the trail of blood behind her, which made it look like she had tried to crawl for help. Because there were no cameras, the front desk was blissfully unaware. We always had problems in that wing of the hotel afterwards. Domestic violence cases always came out of that wing. People's tempers just seemed to skyrocket when they stayed in that area of the hotel. Another interesting story she told me was of a country singer named Charlie Rich, who died in one of our suites. The suites were located inside the lobby facing the front desk. He had a pulmonary embolism whilst his wife was eating breakfast in our restaurant. Mrs. J was even there when his wife found him dead. Room 208. Ever since, a lot of customers complained of people knocking on their door at odd hours. But the front desk never saw anyone go up to the room. One customer came running out in the middle of the night. He said that there was a man in his room. Upon investigation, there was no sign of an intruder. A lot of times when the room would stay vacant for a while, the TV would turn on by itself. I even saw it through an open window. It just turned on. And it was always the same channel, CMT, Channel 71. Charlie never really bothered the staff. I'd even find myself talking to him on one of our more quiet nights. Sometimes I even played my old country playlist for him. I ended up quitting after working there for five years. The owner was doing some sketchy things with my paycheck, so I said my final farewell to the hotel I had grown to love so much. Not even a year after I left, the owner suddenly shut the place down. I am not sure why, but all of the employees were told not to come back the next day, or ever. They left everything in there too. All of the papers, computers, furniture, food. All left inside the massive, vacant, blood-red building. Ever since my first day at this luxury hotel, I'd heard stories of how people killed themselves, overdosed, slit their wrists. One guy even took a shotgun to the face. But none of that fazed me, since there were no ghost stories. Until one night, I came into work around 10.30pm. The girl I relieved from was out in the lobby, which was not unusual. I asked her, what you needed some lobby air? And she just looked at me in horror. Well, once I got situated and ready to work, she explained to me that she kept hearing a little girl say mummy right behind her. I didn't take her too seriously though, as we all love to joke around and scare each other. Move forward a couple of hours, I was done with my work for the night, and I decided to lean back in my chair and close my eyes a little bit. I usually have music playing in the background, but today, I didn't for some odd reason. The moment I closed my eyes, I heard it. I tried to make sense of it, but nothing in the office would make such a noise. I then put some music on and cranked up the volume. Now it's nearing the end of my shift, and my security guard comes into my office to finish up his paperwork in peace. Here we are, me sitting behind my table, and he's sitting at our co-worker's table. We have complete silence when all of the sudden we both hear. We look at each other to verify that we had both heard what we just heard. He looks around and tries to find out where the noise could have come from. It must have been my chair, he said. But you didn't move, I said. Well, it has to be the valet garage door opening, he said. The door has been open all day, I reply. And then again. But this time, we just nope out of there. Later that night, I returned to work and this time, 
I promised I would play music to muffle the noise. I did just that. But at one point in the night, me and the bellman had to go to the fourth floor storage area to grab a couple of items. We grab the items and leave the room. A couch which was standing upright and was just across the room falls over. We shut the lights and nope out of there. None of this stuff was scaring me as bad as the next scene. We are waiting for the service elevator to come down to the fourth floor. And as they open, what we saw will always haunt me. A little pink hairband in the corner of the elevator. Now it's getting out of hand. I took a couple of days off to keep my mind off it after this. A few months later, there was another incident at the gym. At this hotel, our gym is open 24 hours a day, but our pool closes at 11pm. If you stay in the hotel, you will notice that the gym and pool are right next to each other and have windows from the gym facing the pool. Well, this hotel was just like that, except it's located on the fourth floor and also has a balcony. This is where shit really hit the fan. I get a call from the gym. It's a lady, and she has a sort of panic in her voice. I ask her if everything is alright, and if I should call the emergency personnel. She declines and informs me that there's a little girl in the pool area, but she's on the balcony and can't get her card to open the door. As soon as she said little girl, my world just froze in terror. She said that this little girl was watching her from the pool balcony through the windows, but she was not accompanied by any adult. This is when she tried to get the door open but couldn't. The only person in our hotel that can open that door was our engineer. I send our engineer up there. He opens the door and there's no girl to be found. The lady in the gym was terrified and I was scared shitless. And let's just say, I haven't been to that hotel since. I worked at a Hilton property in Wisconsin for a few years during college. It was my last day of working, and I was on the 3 to 11 shift. Generally, I had enjoyed my time working there. It was a Sunday, which meant it was absolutely dead, only six people staying in an 85-room hotel. Being a sentimentalist, towards the end of my shift, I gave one last walk around the hotel a final look at the place before I left. As I made my way to the top floor, I remembered that there was a ladder in a supply closet that led to the roof of the hotel. I had never gone up there before, I had never felt comfortable leaving the desk unattended for long periods, and I could never contrive a reason to go, other than, neat, I'm on a roof. But hey, it was my last shift. No one had approached the desk in a few hours, so a cigarette on the roof sounded pretty romantic. I need to point out that the only way to access the roof was through this ladder, which, being in the supply closet, needed a master keycard to access. So, using the keycard, I entered this supply closet, made my way to the ladder, and unlocked the door. It took some elbow grease, but I eventually felt the rush of spring air as the door opened. It felt great. I stuck my head up to get a look of the view that I would be enjoying. It was then that I saw the figure. It was night and wasn't very well lit, but I could tell that they were tall and impossibly thin. Not only that, they were seemingly transparent. They were squatting, staring down at something. Once I recognised that, wait, that's a person, their head snapped around to look in my direction. I will stress this again, there was no way that anyone could have been up there. There's an alarm that notifies us when the trapdoor is open, 
and without being a member of staff, there was no way anyone could have been there. Upon realising what I was looking at, I gasped and almost fell off the ladder. I couldn't have closed the door and latched it fast enough. I raced back to the desk, and stood there like a terrified bunny for the remaining twenty minutes of my shift, paranoid at the thought of whoever or whatever might be making its way down to say hi. I used to work in a hotel in Southern California, doing security. Every night we would get a printout of which rooms were vacant. It was my job to go through all the rooms and ensure that all the lights were off and that the windows were secure. I went into a room and found the light on. I started turning the lights off from the left side of the room to right around the windows and up to the bathroom. The bathroom has French style doors that open towards the room. The doors themselves only have hinges and two handles to pull on them. No other devices attached. The doors are also made of a very light wood. Anyway, I opened the left door out all the way so that I could reach around it and turn the light off in the bathroom after turning the light off, I realised it was freezing in the room, which is not uncommon being housekeeping liked it cold when they worked on a room. I reached up for the thermostat, and when my hand was within four inches of the door, the bathroom door which I had just opened slammed shut by itself. Terrified, I ran out of the room immediately. Whilst I was pulling the door shut behind me, the deadbolt pushed itself out the door and slammed into the door frame. I was petrified when I had to reach inside the door to disengage it. I stood there for a minute or two with my eyes watering, wondering what had just happened. I decided to go back in and look to just be sure of what happened. I went in and looked at the door. It was shut. I moved it around to see if it would close on its own, which it wouldn't. I tried throwing the door to slam it, and the door is so lightweight, it caught a lot of air and wouldn't even shut all the way after throwing it closed. As far as I could see, there wasn't an explanation for what happened, and I stopped going into that room. I am 28 years old, married, with a baby girl on the way. I'm very happy. However, there is an experience from my childhood that haunts me to this day. I was in the 8th grade, and my mother, sisters and I had fallen on hard times. We bounced between a shelter and a friend's house. After my mum started dating the man who would later become my stepfather, we all moved into a house together. I was ecstatic. I would finally have my own space. But as soon as I walked into that place, my happiness dissipated. It was like a jolt of electricity went through me. Everywhere in that house, I felt uneasy. Bizarrely, the most comfortable place to be in that building was the basement. The first thing you should know about this house is that the upstairs was totally sealed off. All of the doors to the upstairs were painted over and nailed shut. The only explanation we were ever given was that it was being rebuilt, a vague remark which was never elaborated upon. All I really know is that my sisters and I weren't allowed up there and that the doors were firmly nailed shut. One time, my sisters and I tried to be brave and investigate, but the doors were so terrifying that we completely chickened out. The daytime in that house was uncomfortable, yet the nighttime was far worse. What was an uneasy feeling quickly turned into a paralyzing terror, absolute dread. The house always seemed so much darker than it should. 
The first incident I experienced there was of sleep paralysis. I would wake up, unable to scream or move anything but my eyes. And that wasn't very useful, as I've always had a bad stigmatism, needing glasses to see anything. Several times I woke up about 2am, paralysed and afraid to blink. Often, I would hear my closet door quietly shut, before being able to move again. The second time something happened, I was alone inside the house, whilst my mother and sisters waited in the car. I was searching for something when I heard someone call my name. Thinking it was my mother yelling for me to hurry, I turned and went into her room, which was right next to the driveway, to tell her I was trying to hurry. What happened next still terrifies me. The door to the upstairs in my mother's room was open. Remember, these doors were not only painted over, but nailed shut. I heard my voice again, only this time it was a whisper, and it came from the stairs beyond the open door. I was so scared that I noped out my mum's bedroom window. For that, I was immediately grounded, for lying and being dramatic. Later, when we got home, the door was now closed, but the paint was clearly broken and the nails lay all over the floor. This too resulted in me being grounded. I have no idea what spurned my mother to have us move, but shortly after this we moved to the next town over. I have never been so glad to move in my life. My freshman year at college was a difficult one. I was struggling with depression and anxiety. My long-term boyfriend and I were on the edge of a breakup, and my parents and I weren't speaking. I felt very alone, and I was looking for acceptance. My brother and I had shared some paranormal experiences when we were younger, which piqued our interest. So, when I found a paranormal group at college, I was interested. I joined them on one of their outings right away. The leader of the group was a Jewish man, who made sure to pray over us before we went into the field. There was also another member who was our tech guy. He did all the audio recordings. Both were incredibly respectful, and for a college paranormal group, very professional. Besides myself, there was a new member to the group. They were new to the paranormal entirely. A decent way from the city centre, set into a hill, is Sensible Tunnel. This tunnel is surrounded by dark folklore and mystery. Stories have circulated for decades. Eerie sounds, crying and screaming, would reverberate out from the tunnel's dark centre. The most well-known story involves a botched robbery. Late one evening, a mysterious man travelling through the Tennessee hills stopped at a family farmhouse where he was invited in for dinner and shelter for the night. When the family caught him trying to steal their silverware later that night, the man ran for the door. But before he left, he grabbed their infant child, disappearing into the night. The father ran after him, only to find both the robber and his child dead in the tunnel. People say that the sounds of crying and screaming which can be heard there are those of the man and the infant. It has also been said that no one can walk through the tunnel at midnight without going insane or being attacked. Some even report a figure with red eyes lurking in its darkness. If there is one tunnel you should absolutely stay away from, it is the Sensible Tunnel. However, this is precisely where we headed. The tunnel has water running through it, and a narrow ledge that can be walked along. I was the first of the group to enter, meaning I was the farthest into the darkness. The leader of the group started asking questions, whilst our tech guy recorded audio. He was being very respectful in his questioning. 
After just a few minutes, I started to hear what sounded like grunting and grumbling right beside me. It was very low at first, but slowly grew louder. I leaned close to the man next to me and asked him if he heard it too. He nodded. My heart froze. I grabbed his hand and held it for the rest of the time out of fear. Not moving, I continued to listen to the grumbling. It was intoxicating. I was both compelled and terrified. It was then that the other newcomer to the group began yelling into the tunnel. He was intentionally trying to provoke the spirit into a reaction. The last thing he said was, "Effing say something! At that point, the grumbling voice was the loudest. Whatever was making that sound was clearly not happy. It was then that we decided it was best to leave. Later, when we returned to our dorm room, we listened to the audio that we had recorded. There were subtle noises, but suddenly, after our friend yelled effing say something, there was a low but loud voice that said very clearly, shut up. It has now been six years since that day. Thinking about it still gives me the chills. I have not returned to that tunnel, but my interest in the paranormal has only grown since then. I come from a long line of psychics. My great-grandmother on my father's side could predict people's births and deaths and even read their auras. Similarly, my grandmother is able to make some predictions and read people's emotions. My dad was mostly the same. As a child, I quickly realized that I too had been born with a psychic ability. I could read people's emotions. Not only that, I could communicate with the dead. When I was a little girl, I would talk and play with my brother who had died just a few years earlier. I would talk with a man named Charlie, who I claimed had died in World War I. In the backyard, I would often find a red-haired woman called Rose. My parents couldn't see or hear Charlie and Rose, so they assumed that they were just my imaginary friends. It was around this time that my parents rented a small house. They did not know anything about the history of the place, but they were very poor and we needed a place to live. From the very start, I disliked my room. In particular, I hated the closet. I said that there was something in there, and this wasn't just a childish fear. I genuinely believed that there was something in there. In fact, our dog, Dawn, would growl at the closet. The cats would avoid that area of the room if they could, which is saying something considering the cats love to explore every inch of that house. Just not there. Not that closet. When I was still young enough to need a crib, I would always want the crib to be next to the door, as far away from the closet as possible. Dad would say if they tried to move the crib or me to that area of the room, I would start screaming and crying. I would tell them that there was something bad in the closet. Of course, I was never believed, my protests all blamed on the overactive imagination of a child. I think the best way to describe the closet is that it was like a black hole. There was no specific emotion attached to it, just an infinite darkness. In that darkness was an evil. And it was always there. As I got older, if I had to get something out of my closet, I would lean over as far as I could to grab it, so I would have as little of my body as possible in that area. I always feared having to do that, as I was terrified that the entity would grab me. When we first moved in, my mother was severely depressed over the loss of my brother. My father dealt with their bereavement by drinking heavy liquor in an attempt to forget. If dark entities are attracted to emotional weakness, as I have been told that they are, our household was rife with sustenance. And me, the young child of the household, 
was the most vulnerable to target. My first encounter with this entity was when I was still in my crib. At the time, my crib was right next to the light switch. I was rapidly outgrowing it, but my parents couldn't afford a bed for me, so I would stay in that crib for a few more months. There were so many times when I felt a presence hovering over me. Scared, I would bury myself under the blankets for protection, the way that all small children hide under the blankets to protect themselves from monsters. Yet, my monster did not always go away. On one occasion, I felt a sharp poking at my feet, as if someone with long fingernails were tapping the bottom of my foot. At first, I pulled my feet up towards my chest, but the poking continued. It was then that I heard Charlie command, Turn on the lights! I got up and did so. When I looked around, no one was there. Yet, when I turned off the lights to go back to sleep, the poking resumed. This time when I looked, I saw a thin hand with unnaturally long fingers moving at me. What I assumed was the skin was stretched tightly across the bones, giving it a gnarled appearance. The nails of the creature were black, with narrow, red, vein-like lines running down them. The sight of this hand frightened me so badly that I grabbed my blanket and jumped out of my crib with a leap that would have made an antelope proud. I ran to my parents' bedroom and wrapped myself up in my blanket there. Eventually, I fell asleep out of exhaustion. In the morning, I told my parents what had happened. They told me that it had just been a bad nightmare, and that there was nothing evil in my bedroom. Not long after this event, my parents got some old mattresses that would serve as my new bed. Shortly after that, a new issue began to manifest. When getting ready for his paper route, my dad noticed something odd. In the middle of the night, he would find me sprawled out across the floor of my room. At first, he assumed that this was a case of a child rolling out of bed at night. However, before too long, he became suspicious. He said he would find me in places that I could have only been in if someone had pushed me out of bed and across the floor. There were times when I would wake up with long, thin bruises across my back, as if someone's fingers had shoved me. My great-grandmother was a very religious woman, and had a small mirror with a painting of Jesus on it, which she kept in the corner of the room. It had a narrow blue ribbon, so could be hung anywhere. One day, she gave this to me, telling me that a man in an old-fashioned uniform had appeared to her, saying that I should have it for protection. She even went as far as to say that the mirror should be hung next to the closet, so it would be overlooking my bed. Dad agreed and got a hook for hanging pictures. When hanging the mirror, he accidentally struck the hook one too many times, so it bent in on itself. That meant that the only way to remove the mirror would be to lift it up by the ribbon. I also kept a small framed picture of the Virgin Mary on my desk. For about a week afterwards, my room felt lighter and more open. I could play with my brother without feeling scared, and my mysterious rolling out of the bed had even stopped. However, it did not last long. After returning home from school one day, my room felt cold and oppressive again. I knew the entity was back, and it was angry. Slowly walking into my room, I first noticed my picture of the Virgin Mary was facing downward. I picked it up and placed it upright again. When I looked towards my closet, where the mirror should have been, it was gone. I worked up the courage to go to the closet, and saw that my mirror had been torn off the hook and smashed onto the floor. It was in so many pieces on the floor that it looked as though someone had repeatedly stomped on it. As the hook in the wall was undamaged, I could only conclude that it must have been physically moved, lifted up by the ribbon. I told both my parents what had happened. Neither could explain it. My mom blamed it on the cat. My dad was suspiciously silent. That night, the entity lashed out by scratching my back. 
I fled from my bedroom, screaming for help. My experience was once again blamed on a nightmare, but I was allowed to sleep on the couch that night. At this point, I was terrified of being alone. I could feel that my brother and Charlie were with me. I made them promise to stay with me. From then on, if I was put to bed, I would stay awake until my parents went to sleep. Then I would get up and go to sleep out in the hallway, until I was discovered and forced to go back to my own bed. There I would hide under my blankets, terrified of sleep, terrified of the evil entity that lurked in the closet of my room. The entity never once spoke to me. It only ever lurked, waiting to terrorize me. I believe that it was demonic. For a long time, my parents refused to believe my claims. That was until my dad was homesick one day. He had heard a noise coming from my bedroom and went to investigate, thinking it was a cat or our dog. What he saw frightened him so much that he would not tell me what it was until years later. When I got home from school, he immediately ordered me to go play in the backyard. He told me not to argue. I could tell he was serious. I remained in the backyard until the sun began to set. During that time, I saw someone in dark robes enter and leave the house. All of my belongings were moved out of the room and placed into the spare bedroom. I was forbidden from entering my old bedroom again, unless I had one of my parents with me. About a month after, we moved out of the house. Years later, my dad told me that, when he heard the noise, he went to my room to see what looked like a human heart with large fangs in the doorway. Though startled, he thought it was his imagination a trick of the eye. When he went into my room, the entity had changed into a misty figure resembling a man's body, with the heart with the fangs being where the head should have been. Instantly, my dad had slammed the door and ran to the phone. He called the priest, telling him what he had seen and asking him to do an emergency blessing on my bedroom. After the blessing, the priest warned that the best thing to do for my safety was to leave the house. So, once our lease was up, we left. About ten years ago, I learned that the renters before us had been members of a dark cult, and would summon demonic entities in my bedroom. In particular, the closet was used as some sort of gateway for them, where the entities would enter and leave. Eventually, the people were kicked out of the house. However, the portal was never closed, which allowed the demonic entity to enter the house and terrorize me. Even to this day, I can't pass by my old house without wondering if that entity is still there. I have never told anyone this story before. I must have been about six years old when it happened. It was the evening and my dad rushed into the living room. He said, have you seen those flashing lights in the sky? My dad, sister and I rushed outside. There, in the sky above us, were lights going around in a circle. Red, blue and white lights. Although I was very young at the time, and I didn't really know what was going on, I was confused by what I was seeing. I remember my dad telling me that they looked like a UFO. It wasn't until I was older that I realized what UFO meant. Everyone on our street was outside, their eyes turned to the sky. At least 20 people watched this thing hover silently above us. Before too long, the police showed up and ushered everyone back inside. Some people refused to leave. They were fixated on the lights. They continued to go round and round in a circle, silently, as we moved away. Just after we went back into the house, there was a loud bang. I believe it was supersonic. It set all the car alarms off. Whatever had been in the sky was now gone. To this day, it still sends shivers down my spine.
For much of my childhood, I lived with my great-grandparents on their farm in South Texas. The year was 1972. I was 12 years old, and my younger brother was 10. My brother and I slept in the middle of the house on single beds. Our bedroom window faced east, overlooking the 13 acres of field that my grandfather used to grow feed for his animals. It was spring, and the field had just been turned, furrowed, and seeded. On that particular night, my brother and I went to bed around 9pm. However, neither of us could sleep. Before bedtime, we had both seen some strange objects flying through the sky. We had been with adults at the time, including my uncle, who was a major in Strategic Air Command. One of the objects had looked like a ball of burning fire. My uncle reported it to the police department, who told him the Weather Bureau claimed it was a meteor burning up upon entering the atmosphere. However, the fiery sphere had travelled from east to west, across the horizon. Around that time, we had also been getting lots of jets from the nearby airfield flying low over our farm. In hindsight, my time in the military has made me realise that the jets may have been flying low to avoid the radar. At the time, my uncle had pointed out one particular aircraft that he didn't recognise. As he was a rated officer, and would have been familiar with all known types of military aircraft, he was confused. This too, he phoned in, not as an alien ship or anything like that, but as an aircraft he couldn't identify. The Air Force Base scrambled two jets that broke the sound barrier to get to our area, but the craft had already disappeared. As bizarre as it had been, Strange objects in the sky were only the start of my brother and I's encounter. One evening, whilst watching TV with one of my relatives who had seen the fireball, there was a loud stomping on the roof. The footsteps ran from the back to the front porch, along the main beam of the house. It sounded like a giant. Startled, my older relative grabbed my grandfather's lever-action rifle and told us to stay in the house. He went outside. When he came back, he told us that there was no one there. It was after he went back to his marine base that I started having the dreams. I dreamt about doctors with masks on, doing something to my teeth. I also began sleepwalking. My grandmother, who would rise before dawn, would find me standing in the hallway that connected her room to ours. One day, I asked my brother if he had any reoccurring dreams about doctors. He told me he did. Every night. We promised each other that the next time it happened, we would both try to shout out, so we would wake up to see if the dreams were real. It was evening, and my brother and I had just got to bed. My grandparents were on the back porch, just behind our bedroom. My grandmother in her chair and footstool, and my grandfather in his rocking chair. Just before we fell asleep, I noticed that there was a set of car headlights going down the road at the far end of the field, toward the house where my aunt, uncle and four cousins lived. It was very dark, so all we could see were the headlights and what they illuminated. I thought the driver might have been drunk, since the vehicle's high beams were on. When you live in the country, you learn all about those who live around you. What kind of car they drive what time they leave and come home, who belongs there, and who doesn't. You have to, because there is only a sheriff and deputies to call, and they are around ten miles away. Strangers mean trouble. They could steal your farm equipment, your animals, or break into your home. The rule of the country is to keep an eye out for your neighbour, in the hope that they will return the favour. My brother and I watched the headlights go towards my uncle's house. Usually, his dogs would come out barking, but this time they were silent. As we watched, the headlights stopped. It looked like the vehicle was trying to turn around, and go back the other way down the road. It was then that my heart skipped a little. I sensed someone watching us, like they knew we were watching them out the window. The light stopped, and turned our way. I joked to my brother that it looked like the drunk was going to run into our barbed wire fence and get stuck in the drainage ditch. Regardless, the lights kept coming towards the house. The idiot was now coming across the field. He must really be drunk, I told my brother, 
and would probably have to pay my grandfather for the fence he had destroyed. The field was furrowed, but the headlights stayed level and slowly approached the house directly towards the window my brother and I were watching from. I wondered where our dogs were, as they should have been barking by now. There were two more fences between the vehicle and our house. I doubted the driver would go through them both. The headlights reached the first fence and stopped. He's done, I told my brother. Then, to our horror, the lights began to raise up off the ground and passed over the top of the fence. We saw this very clearly, as the lights were now approximately 100 yards away. We shouted at the same time, MONSTER! Terrified, we called to our grandparents. By now, the vehicle was making a churning noise, like industrial motors running. It was so loud that my brother and I were shouting at the top of our lungs and could barely hear ourselves. We fled the room and hid under the kitchen table. There was still no response from our grandparents. The door leading from the kitchen outside to the back porch was wide open. The effort it took me to leave the hiding place, go over to the door, close and lock it, with who knows what watching from the other side, was tremendous. We weren't safe. I got my brother to stop screaming, telling him if we weren't quiet the monsters would surely find us. I prayed to God to send an angel to save us. I closed my eyes, putting my fingers in my ears and waited to see if we would be found. Eventually the sound went away, gradually getting more distant. I wept with gratitude that we had been spared. I heard my grandparents talking from the porch. My grandmother asked my grandfather if he had closed the door. I crawled out from under the kitchen table and went to where they were sitting. Why hadn't they come inside of the house? Had they not heard my brother and I screaming for them? Had they not heard the machine? My grandmother looked clueless. Using my full name, she asked me what I was going on about. Switching tactics, I told my grandfather I had seen someone drive off the road and break through our fence. He went outside and then came back saying there was no one there and the fence was fine. I was shocked. It just couldn't be. I went back into the kitchen to get my brother to help me convince our grandparents of what had happened, but he was asleep under the kitchen table. I helped him back into his bed. Exhausted, I fell asleep in my own immediately. The next day when I was alone with my brother, I asked him to come with me to tell our grandparents what had happened. My brother acted as if he didn't understand. When I related the events to him, he said he didn't remember any such thing, and that I was talking crazy. But I wasn't crazy. I know what had happened last night. Why was I the only one to remember it? A month later, whilst I was walking up the road to visit my cousins, I once again got the feeling of being watched. I knew exactly where to look to see what was watching me. It was above me on my right. In the movie Starman, the spaceship was a large, reflective sphere. That was what I was looking at right above my grandfather's field. At first, I thought it was a planet, because of the reflection of the ground below on its reflective surface. Then I understood it was something not of this world. It hung without a noise above the field. I stood there on the road, staring at it. Then I got angry. I shouted at it. Okay, you got me. Now what? The sphere just gradually vanished into a cloud bank and disappeared. I did not mention the second event to anyone, because after the reaction of my own family from the first, there was no point. No one would believe me. I know how it sounds. I know this is unbelievable. But I swear on the Bible that these events did occur and that I relay them to you in complete truth as far as my memory allows. I was abducted by aliens. Many years ago, I worked the night shift as a security guard. On that particular night, I had left early, so it was around 2am in the morning. The road I travelled on, although a main road, was surrounded by countryside on both sides. In the daytime, you could see farmer's fields for miles and miles. Then, I could only see the reflection of my car's lights on the tarmac. 
I remember it was a clear night. As usual, the road was empty of other cars. So, when I came around a corner to see a car blocking the road, I was surprised. The driver's door was wide open, and its lights were on. At first, I thought it had crashed. Only when I stopped did I see a man standing by the gateway into a field. He was just standing there, staring into the darkness. I saw nothing. Then, as if from nowhere, a bright light beamed into the field. The light was intense and pencil thin. As I got out the car and approached the man, he shouted, Did you see that? He pointed across the field to a far hedgerow to where the light was. Almost as soon as the light appeared, it went out. However, there was no residue, no fade as the light absorbed into the blackness of the night. It just disappeared perfectly, unnaturally. My heart pounded, confused at what I was seeing. Within a matter of moments, the light was back, once again intense and pencil thin. Once again, it disappeared suddenly without residue. Both me and the man stood there in awe. This happened four or five more times before the light disappeared for good. It was a very still night, with no sounds or movement for miles. Neither one of us could make sense of what we had just witnessed. A couple of days later, I saw a strange report in the local newspaper. There had been dozens of sightings of bright lights in the sky that same night I stopped at the field, including reports from personnel at Royal Air Force bases. They claimed to have seen a craft flying at about 200 feet, which fired a narrow beam of light which swept the ground. Since that day, no one has been able to explain what I and many others saw that night. All I know is that it will stay with me forever. What lurks in the darkness, just waiting out of sight? The Paranormal Scholar invites you to sit down and listen to these allegedly true tales of paranormal encounters, submitted to us by our subscribers and narrated, in part, by the horror narrator Swamp Dweller. I have a story to tell about a little town called Falk in Arkansas. In the 1970s, the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek was released. It told of the Falk monster, a bipedal, sasquatch-like creature, which was claimed to have been sighted in the area since the 1950s. It was accused of destroying livestock and even attacking a local family. After watching the movie, my curiosity was up, so, one day, I made my mind up to go investigate for myself. I made my way to Falk by hitchhiking. It was a little after one in the morning when I finally arrived. There was very little in the way of street lighting, so the town was pitch black. To the point that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. You couldn't even see the road you were standing on. You could just feel the surface of it under your feet as you walked. After around 20 minutes of walking, I was outside of town. It was when I started hearing the noises. Noises unlike anything I have ever heard before in my life. They were something of a roar, but more creepy. I stopped at the edge of the trail, listening for the direction of the sound, hoping to identify the source. The night was so black, I still couldn't see anything at all. Then, suddenly, I felt hair, something kind of brush against my face. It was accompanied by a god-awful smell. I froze. I am not sure how long I stood there, frozen to the ground, but it felt like a very long time. My brain was telling my feet to move, but they just wouldn't respond, either unwilling or unable. It was like I was being circled by something. I could feel it was there even if I couldn't see it. Eventually, I started to run. I ran until I couldn't run anymore. Thank God I stumbled across a convenience store. It was closed, but it had its lights on outside. I went to put my back against the door and sat down. I must have dozed off, as the store owner found me there in the morning and woke me up. 
After buying a drink and some cigarettes, I was on my way. The smell of whatever had approached me last night still lingered on my clothes. I tried to dust myself off, but ended up pulling brownish, black hair off my clothes. I don't know what kind of animal they came from. All I know is that after my little investigation trip, my mind was made up. I will never go through Falk, Arkansas ever again. Everything I write in this story is true. Yes, that is a cliché, but that doesn't change the fact that my tale is completely true. The legend of Mercy Brown is well known in Rhode Island, USA. She was suspected of being a vampire, so, amongst other things, the ground around her grave in Exeter was scorched, and for decades nothing grew. To this day, it is easy to tell which grave is hers, as a giant brown circle devoid of any vegetation encompasses her gravesite. Years ago, I had a girlfriend who lived in Exeter. It is a rural community in the central part of the state. Neighborhoods lack streetlights and are surrounded by a thick, dark and dense sea of trees. It is very easy to get lost, and even if one has his bearings, it's still very creepy. One night, my ex-girlfriend and I drove through the thick forest to visit Mercy Brown's grave. Both her and I are atheists and just went to the cemetery for some spooky fun. It was early October and there was a sharp chill in the air. We walked towards her grave, which was easily discerned even in the blackness of the remote graveyard. True to my rebel nature, I began to dance above and on Mercy Brown's grave. My ex told me to stop, but I continued to make a fool of myself, spitting in the face of conventional tradition. We then left the cemetery and went back to her house. The next night, I was back at my place. I happened to be living in a hotel near my university. I only needed a place for a semester, and the rate was surprisingly low. That night, I slept deeply only to be awakened in the morning with a multitude of what appeared to be large, swollen bite marks on my legs. I brushed it off as being the work of the ever-present, if slightly larger than usual, mosquitoes around New England. However, upon further reflection, I realized that several frosts had already occurred, killing off many of the mosquitoes, and driving the survivors to seek refuge in the plethora of damp, fallen leaves that abounded throughout the region. Not only that, the bites didn't itch, which is normally a telltale sign of an insect bite. Next I thought that the bites might have been from fleas, but I didn't have any pets nor did I interact with any animals whatsoever, but regardless, I still bug bombed my hotel room. But the bites didn't cease. Bedbugs. That must have been it. Or so I thought. I asked the hotel to inspect my room for an infestation. When they came back and told me that they didn't find anything, I didn't believe them. The bites were still scarring my legs. After all, I had agreed to stay at the hotel for several months, and finding an insect infestation could be a way for me to get out of the contract. Not to mention a PR disaster that would await them if the case of bedbugs was to be found in the hotel. So I had a hard time believing my complaints were unwarranted. Understandably pissed, the manager herself went into my room and tossed my mattress and headboard, showing me that there was no sign of insects anywhere in my room. Convinced but not satisfied, I threw away my shoes and socks in the hopes that they would get rid of my phantom aggressors. Once again, the bites continued. By now, I was very confused as to the origin of the bites. After about a month of waking up with new red piercings in my flesh, the bites stopped. Just as randomly as they began, they stopped. I still can't explain the bites on my legs. I am naturally a skeptic of the supernatural, but Mercy Brown and her vampirism very well could have been behind my markings. To this day, I will not step foot in Mercy Brown's graveyard, and I will never dance on a grave again. This happened to me and a few friends back when I was 17 years old. I am 50 now, and since that time I have never experienced anything even remotely paranormal again. But the events 
that I am about to describe had such a profound effect that my interest in the paranormal was sustained for all of these years. It's the reason I subscribe to all of these channels concerning anything paranormal or otherwise creepy. Real stories interest me the most. After what happened, I cannot be a skeptic. It is simply not possible. The events took place in 1984. I don't remember the exact start date. It was sometime during the summer, but I know it ended on November 2nd, around 3.15 AM. My small group of friends were all between the ages of 15 and 21. My girlfriend at the time was 21, but no one else was older than 18. So as kids in our mid to late teens, we used to hang out like everywhere. It could be deep in the woods, abandoned buildings, you name it, the stranger the better. That being said, the area that this took place was anything but. We parked down a residential street. To our left and across the street were houses, and to our right was a sidewalk and a row of bushes, a fence, and beyond that a large park. Unlike our usual haunts, there was nothing strange or creepy about it. In fact, it was a beautiful setting. We would go there whenever we did not have alcohol, as cops patrolled the area regularly. We did what anyone of age would do back at the time, hang out, listen to music, and talk about whatever. The very first time we parked there was a summer night, and it was just me and my girlfriend. I'll skip the details and get right to the strange points. At some point, during the night, we each heard a bang on the back of the car. Roughly five to ten minutes later, there was another. My girlfriend and I looked at each other. It just sounded like something was inside the trunk of the car. My girlfriend said that she had unloaded boxes from her trunk earlier that day and a squirrel must have jumped inside and got closed in by mistake. Her sentence was almost immediately followed by another bang. Unable to offer another explanation, I agreed that it must have been a trapped animal. I got out and opened the trunk, stepping away as I did, expecting a frightened animal to fly out. However, nothing did. There was nothing there. I got back inside the car. The bang continued. Once again, I got out and investigated the trunk, this time checking it from top to bottom. Still, nothing there. Confused, we decided to leave. At some point, the incident was all but forgotten, and we went back. This time, it was a gaggle of us. If I remember correctly, it was two couples and a third wheel. So, five of us in one car. At one point during the night, the same banging my girlfriend and I had experienced started. Every 5 to 15 minutes we were hearing a bang on the back of the car. I asked if one of my friends would get out and bang on the trunk with his fist. He did so, and it sounded exactly like the banging noise we had been hearing. Over the course of the summer, regardless of who we brought with us and what car we were in, the banging continued. It always bothered me, but I learned to ignore it. Strangely, it only ever happened at night. Anytime we were there during the day, there would be nothing. At this point, I want to stress that this was 1984 and I was 17. There were no smartphones or social media. There wasn't even an internet. Anything and everything I knew was from word of mouth books or someone telling me face to face. I was a clueless idiot. I had never heard of the Lady in White, Skinwalkers, or any urban legends. I was a blank slate. So, what I experienced over these next two nights was all new to me. It was October 31st, Halloween night. On this night, it was just my girlfriend and I and her Camaro. We were parked in our usual spot. There were no cars in front of us, so we had a clear view of the street right to its end. Sometime during that night, we saw a cat jogging merrily down the road in front of us. This is nothing unusual, but... It wouldn't have caught our attention normally. However, the cab kept jogging towards us, and we appeared to be its target destination. It came all the way down to the car until it jumped on the hood. We both snapped back in our seats. The cat stared at us for about two full seconds before it jumped off and ran across the street. I remember telling my girlfriend that I might have been worried if it had been a black cat, but it wasn't. Although it had been a little bizarre, we brushed it off and remained. Later on, we heard leaves being crunched to my right and behind the car. I could see right to the bush line in my mirror, 
but there was nothing there. My girlfriend said it was probably just an animal. I said no, it wasn't. They were someone's footsteps. I could hear them clearly. Footsteps between the bush line and the fence, drawing nearer to us. Still, I couldn't see anything. Once the footsteps were close enough that they were near the back of the car, my girlfriend put it in drive and took off. The following night, November 1st, we returned. After Halloween night, my curiosity had been piqued. We parked just shy of the bush line. Most of this night passed without event, other than the usual bangs. Then, at some point during the night, I saw a woman walking across the street towards us. She was young, with shorter length brown hair. As she drew closer, she started to unnerve me. She was extremely pale, and was wearing clothing not of this period. I quickly glanced down at the clock, and it was 3.15am. When I looked back up, the frighteningly pale woman was coming closer to the passenger side of the car. My window was down about 10 inches. I instinctively decided to roll it up out of fear. However, I couldn't move my arm. I looked up to see the woman gesturing to me with her hands as she walked. At first, I thought this maybe was sleep paralysis, despite never having experienced anything like this before. However, the terrifying woman continued gesturing, moving in my direction. I could still feel my entire body, I just couldn't move more than an inch in any direction. It was as if invisible restraints were on every limb. I tried to call out, but could only raise my voice above a whisper. I thought this woman was a witch. Binding me, I tilted my head to my girlfriend, but she was fast asleep. I whispered her name and tried to bang my foot against the floorboard in an attempt to make her wake up. This didn't work, so I put all of my attention on trying to roll up the window. I finally broke free of the woman's power, when she was only about two feet away from the window. As soon as I could move again, she vanished. I, I was terrified and frantically rolled up the window. Before I had the chance to wake up my girlfriend, something jumped on top of the car. And all I could hear was the metal buckling, and the car rocked up and down. My girlfriend woke up immediately. I got out of the car, but there was nothing there. I hurried back in the car as my girlfriend started to drive off. As we were approaching the park limits, we heard yet more action on the roof. Something was still up there, moving around and making lots of noise. I was just stunned and didn't know what the freak was going on. Then, the rear of the vehicle dropped down suddenly and back up again. It was as if something very heavy slid off the back. I stared out the back window until the road turned and exited the park area. Once again, I saw nothing. Needless to say, we didn't go back. Five years later, when I was 22 and retelling the story to a group of new friends, and yes, a new girlfriend, some of them wanted to see for themselves. We went back, but nothing happened. No bangs, no cats, no footsteps. Whatever had been there those nights was gone. There's a theory that young people in their teens can manifest things like this. Certainly, I could explain the terrifying witch woman as hallucinations or sleep paralysis. On their own, each event, the cat, the footsteps, could be explained away as an oddity. But a big part of me knows that this was not the case. Something jumped on our car that night. Something banged the car throughout the summer. Regardless of who I was with, or what car we were in, there was something about that particular place. Considering everything that happened there, can I truly explain anything away? There is an old Quaker cemetery a couple of miles from my house. To get there, you have to drive to a path behind a local airport, and then walk three quarters of a mile through thick woods. The walk normally takes around 10 to 15 minutes. This particular cemetery is infamous among the local community, with many stories and urban legends associated with it. Some say that a boy hung himself there in the 1800s. Others report a roaring sound coming from the woods surrounding it. To some, the cemetery is known as the Seventh Gate to Hell. The legend goes that, spread throughout the US, there are eight cemeteries known as the Eight Gates of Hell. Admittedly, America has no shortage of haunted graveyards, but these eight are said to be the worst. Supposedly, 
the location of the eighth cemetery is only revealed after visiting the first seven. There have been maybe a dozen accounts of such searches going on, but only two claim to have ventured to the final secret location. It is said that no one heard back from these people again after visiting the eighth cemetery. None of this really deterred me from checking out Spidergate Cemetery. My friends and I quite often visited it at night because we liked the thrill of thinking there might be something actually paranormal in this area. I've always been a firm believer of the paranormal, but I've never been scared of anything I've heard. One night in mid-October, my friends and I decided to go to the cemetery again. It was still quite warm and I picked up my friends from their houses and drove them to where we had to start walking. I've been to the cemetery during the day and at night more times than I can count, so I knew precisely how long it took to walk the path and what the surroundings looked like, even at night. When we reached where the tree line began, everything seemed normal. However, when we got to the creek which marked the halfway point to the cemetery, I started to feel uneasy. I had never had this feeling before during the previous times I'd gone to this place. Unnerved, I looked around. My friends asked me what was wrong. I brushed it off and told them it was nothing, joking that I was just trying to freak them out. However, the uneasy feeling just kept getting worse the closer we got to the cemetery. A little way past the creek, lightheadedness washed over me, and I started getting tunnel vision. Once again, this sort of thing had never happened to me before, and I had felt fine at the start of the walk. It was then that I noticed the surrounding area looked different from usual. Not only that, but the walk to the cemetery seemed to be taking longer than normal. Around 100 yards from the cemetery gates, my tunnel vision and lightheaded feeling went away. My friends and I went into the cemetery and walked around for a bit. The uneasy feeling still troubled me, but nothing out of the ordinary happened. After a while, we started our walk back to where we had parked. All throughout that walk back, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched and followed. There was a tightness in my chest and a constant chill down my spine. I told my friends what I was feeling, and they said that they felt like something was watching us too. In silence, we hurried through the woods. This time, the walk took the usual amount of time, and the surroundings looked familiar. When we finally reached the end of the woods, the heavy feeling in my chest lifted. The sensation of being watched, however, remained. It was like I could feel eyes on me. Terrified, I didn't dare look back until I was halfway to the car. At that point, curiosity got the better of me. I turned back to the entrance to the woods. There, at the tree line, was a dark figure, just staring at us, unmoving, unflinching. I knew we had to get out of there. We jumped into the car and sped away. I wasn't satisfied until we were back on some main streets that I knew, away from the wood in the cemetery away from that figure. It had followed us, and then just stood there, watching as we went back to my car. I haven't been back to the cemetery since, but plan to go back now that the weather is warmer, to see if it happens again. This was the first time I have been genuinely scared by this kind of experience. I will never think of Spidergate Cemetery the same way again. <laughs>